Okay, if you had to come up with uh, some ideas of archaeological evidence that would indicate that warfare was increasing during a particular time period, what kinds of evidence do you think uh, you could come up with? That is, uh, what sort of evidence would indicate that warfare was increasing during a particular time period? Well, a lot of um, students, when I ask this question, will say things like mass burials uh, showing uh, violent trauma. And indeed, that would be good evidence. Unfortunately, we don't get that <clears throat> from early dynastic Mesopotamia. In later periods, um, we do find that in cities that were attacked. Sometimes you'll find you know, people with arrows in their, uh, in their bones and things like that. We don't get that during uh, the early dynastic period, though, unfortunately. So any other pieces of evidence? You might say increasing weapons, and that is something that we do find. We find more and more weapons, especially in burials. Uh, any other pieces of evidence? Well, you might say, what about fortified walls around cities? Yes, in fact, uh, during the early dynastic, all of these different cities that we've looked at so far have walls around them. Um, so, and, and that we've said walls could sometimes be for flooding. In this case, it seems to be for protection against enemies. We also have increasing depictions of war in art, and we have cuneiform texts that talk about wars and battles. So we've got evidence from walls, weapons, artwork, and historical documents. And all of that together gives us an idea that warfare uh, is increasing during the early dynastic period. Uh, for example, not just a, in the royal tombs of Ur, but also in other uh, archaeological excavations, uh, we uh, archaeologists have found uh, depictions of kings or warriors holding weapons going off to battle. There are actual uh, weaponry found in archaeological deposits. These, this is a bronze sword, and these are bronze axes. Now, because of the warfare that was going on, weapons technology and armaments become increasingly better. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's an arms race, essentially. Uh, so if an enemy develops a better kind of helmet, you develop a better kind of axe. And so we can see, for example, the axes in Mesopotamia becoming um, more developed. Axes in Egypt at this time consisted of a flat piece of metal that was placed into a piece of wood and lashed down. Unfortunately, with that kind of setup, if you hit the axe too hard, the wood would split. And so what the Mesopotamians developed was what's called a socket axe where you can see the wooden handle fits right into that hollowed portion of the axe. And so the wood would not split as a result. Um, and so in Mesopotamia, we have increasing, um, you know, development of weapons. Some of these weapons will have the title of the name. For example, the spear says Lugal, King of Kish. Uh, King of Kish is not... Um, doesn't mean specifically that the king is a king of the city of Kish, which is in northern part of the southern area of Mesopotamia, right? So this is, you can see, this is southern Mesopotamia. Um, that northern portion later on is called Akkad. The southern portion is Sumer. Um, King of Kish in the early periods does mean specifically the king who is the king of this city. Uh, but later on, it becomes an honorific title, which uh, essentially means king of this whole northern section of southern Mesopotamia. Right. Uh, and so if a king from, let's say, a city like Lagash says that he is the king of Kish, what he is saying is basically he's the king of the whole area or laying claim as the king of this whole area. So we'll see titles like king of Kish, king of Sumer or king of Uruk. 
All right, so if you say you're king of Kish, it means you're king here. And if you're king of Rook, you're king of the southern section as well. So different kings will lay claim to being essentially the best king in the whole area or the most dominant one. But different kings lay claim to the title different periods. And there's a real fight for supremacy between these different cities, right? So one city might be stronger than another one time period. Another city might be stronger during the next, uh, you know, century uh, and so on and so on. OK, we talked about the royal standard of war before. We'll just show some more pictures of that that showed depictions of warfare and also some of the uh, royal uh, equipment that was found from Mescalamdog, who was maybe a king, maybe a prince, uh, specifically from Or, where we found the helmet and the symbol of, we think, kingship, that royal hairstyle. Um, etched in a gold version. Now this obviously wouldn't be worn in the battle. It's made out of gold. It wouldn't be much protection. It's decorative and it's symbolic. Same with the gold dagger here. <clears throat> that would not be of much use, but it's taking the symbol of a weapon and making it into a precious form. So it's essentially taking the ideology of warfare uh, and combining it with a precious material. We saw in the Royal Tombs of War that standard was found. It's that wooden box that was covered with lapis lazuli and, um, and ivory and sandstone, right? Um, and uh, depicting on one side war uh, scenes of peace, as you can see here. Um, and it may actually be depicting the victory after the battle, not necessarily peace. Um, the feast and banquet after the battle, right, with important figures on the top and the bases of the uh, civilization below, like fish, sheep and goat, right, people carrying different goods. Um, and you can see this is you know, pretty sophisticated artwork for the time. We're going to see how, how much the art improves in the next time period. Uh, but this is very typical Sumerian uh, artwork. It looks like uh, men and women wore these kinds of kilts or shawls. They're probably sheepskin. We have some depictions. You can see here the fringes here might be showing that it's a goatskin or sheepskin tunic that he's wearing. It's got uh, a golden cup, just like ones that were found in other sections of the royal tombs of Ur. Uh, and again, none of this material is locally available, so all had to be imported to make this um, this box. Uh, and, and then the other side are scenes of warfare. Uh, battle going down below with these donkey chariots, uh, soldiers and naked captives, bound captives who are being brought back to the city. And then probably the king uh, looking over the captives being brought back home. Uh, these are not quite chariots. Some people would say they're not chariots, technically. They're more like carts because they've got four wheels, not uh, two wheels. Chariots usually have two wheels. They're pulled by horses. They didn't have horses yet in Mesopotamia. They just were starting to be domesticated in Central Asia. Hadn't reached Southern Mesopotamia yet. Um, so they had to use kind of a, a hybrid wild domesticated donkey. Uh, you can see that would pull the cart, but this provided mobility uh, on the battlefield. Um, we don't know exactly what all the soldiers are wearing. Look like a helmet. There were bronze or copper, hardened copper helmets from the Royal Tombs of Ur. But is this like a leather cloak with reinforcements like uh, bronze uh, circles on it? That's one idea. You can see here's the chariots running over the corpses of the dead soldiers, the dead enemies. Right, so we get on, on this, we don't get much of an idea of how the battle was fought, but we do kind of get sort of the aftermath and the victory. Uh, but we'll see from the Steely of the Vultures, we do get a little bit more clear idea of how these battles may have been fought. Okay, so this is what maybe one of these um, Sumerian war carts uh, look like and what the, the garb and the tire of the king and the driver might have looked like. Okay, and you can see, you know, the level of detail here. 
All right, one of the most important finds from Southern Mesopotamia from the early dynastic uh, is called the Stele of the Vultures. Stele is again a stone carving. This was erected by a king whose name was Aenatum. He was king of Lagos around uh, 2440 BC, and it was meant to commemorate a victory over a neighboring city of Uma. Uh, as we talked about earlier, uh, cities are not, in the early dynastic, are not equally distributed across the landscape in southern Mesopotamia. They're closely tied to the rivers and the canals of the rivers. Uh, so where there's no water, you can't live. And it, during this time period, the water levels of the rivers start to decrease, making irrigation and irrigation projects even more important. Now, um, we're going to see that this, uh, the cities of Lagash and Uma were neighbors. Um, and most of the text describing the on and off feud between these cities comes from Lagash. So we really only have their point of view. We don't really have the point of view of Uma. Um, so we have to take everything kind of with a grain of salt. But the city of Lagash also ruled over a nearby city of Girsu. Uma was located right here. So you can see they're only 20 miles apart. Um, which means that if you were standing on the ziggurat of Girsu, um, in the distance, you might be able to see the ziggurat faintly in the distance of Uma. Right? That is, you know, they, 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 weren't, they were very, very close. Now, what you'll see also is when you look at it is that they're all on one of the tributaries of the Euphrates or the Euphrates itself. And you can see that Uma is upstream. So they had an advantage, just like in uh, water conflicts today in the Middle East. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, if you're upstream and you divert water, the um, cities downstream are going to be, you know, pretty ticked off, obviously. Uh, and conflict could result. Now, there had been conflict over where the boundary was. Where's our territory? Where's your territory? And so there actually was third party arbitration, what, what we would call today, by uh, someone who claimed to be the king of Kish, Meselim. Um, and so he had kind of an important title, being the king of Kish. Um, and uh, Lagash had prime access to some of this uh, water. Uh, and one of the, the best areas was this border territory called Gudeina, which is basically translates as edge of the plain. Now, if you're going to invest labor into building irrigation canals in this area, uh, you want to keep that territory. You don't want let's say your neighbor to take it from you. Okay, so again, we only get this, an idea of what's going on from Lagash. Uh, and so Uma is always described as being the bad guy, always described as being aggressive, unjust, dishonest, etc. Uh, from the point of view of uh, Lagash. Um, the king that we're going to read about today from the Stila is a king called Aenatum. Right. This is one of the first major battles between these two cities. Uh, after he's no longer king, after he dies, his brother, Ainanatum, you can see how it's easy to confuse these people, becomes the king, also fights against Uma. And then Ainanatum's son, Entemina, or sometimes written Enmetina, also becomes king of Lagash and goes to war against Uma. This is uh, one of the important documents. As you'll see, the Stele of the Vultures is incomplete and it's broken. So we don't get the whole story from that document. Fortunately, there are other documents from the same time period that talk about the same events. And so by putting all the documents together, we kind of get an idea of what was going on. 
Here's what's called the Aenatum Boulder, which has an inscription describing uh, some of uh, these events, right? And you, know, you can see it's written in this very simple cuneiform uh, from the uh, early dynastic period. And over here, you might be able to recognize Lugal. Right? Okay, so we're going to notice a couple of themes in works of art like the Stele of the Vultures. There's definitely a, an ideological connection to warfare uh, and kingship. Uh, there's, you know, depictions of the gods. The gods are playing a role in the battle. And we're also going to see this ambition for supremacy. So as one uh, historian uh, phrases it, kings in Mesopotamia lay claim to the right to practice violence. Ultimately, the only violence that was legitimate was state-sponsored and divinely sanctioned. Kings promised to banish violence at home, except when performed under their auspices, and they pledged to bring the outside world to battle in a muscular extension of power uh, over that world. Right? So this became more and more a part of being king, uh, practicing violence on people outside the city, and ensuring peace uh, at home. Okay, uh, was this battle fought over water? Yes and no. I, as, uh, I, it, there's some debate, you know, I think you can debate it, but clearly when the people of Lagash say why they're fighting, they're fighting over territory. Um, watered, irrigated territory that they lay claim to, right? So that's what uh, it seems the battle is about. But there might be also other things going on. Um, it's al also, they say, that it's because the god Ningirsu wants it, because his territory was taken, and it's the territory of Ningirsu, and Ningirsu wants that territory back. So it's the will of the gods as well. Um, which is sort of an ideological support for the war. How could you not support a war that the god supports, uh, basically commands, right? So here you can see Uma, Girsu, Lagash, right? And you can see how they were all on that uh, tributary. And Uma had the slight advantage because it was upstream. Okay, so the role of the king was to, you know, serve the god by subjugating the world outside the city and then bringing back the resources. Okay. In the uh, text, again, it, it has that introduction where it talks about, uh, you know, the Aenatum as being beloved by the gods. Uh, here, in one of the texts, it says, Enlil, king of all the lands, father of all the gods, by his righteous command, for Ningirsu and Shar, demarcated the border ground. Meselim, king of Kish, by the command of Ishtaran, laid the measuring line upon it, and on that place he erected a stela. Right, so this is essentially this third-party arbitration. Uh, there's debate and, and kind of um, you know, uh, between Uman Lagash, where exactly the territory of one city ends and the territory of another city begins. Uh, and so a third party comes in, this king of Kish, he uh, demarcates the boundary and he sets up a stela, a stone marker, to show that this is where the boundary exists between these two cities. Now, what happens? Well, Ush, ruler of Uma, acted arrogantly. He smashed that monument and marched on the plain of Lagash. Ningirsu, warrior of Enlil, at Enlil's just command, did battle with Uma. At Enlil's command, he cast the great battle net upon it and set up burial mounds for it on the plain, right? So again, this is, you know, who's fighting here? The gods. And the, the king is basically just a servant of the god. Um, so we're going to now look at the stele of the vultures, which depicts Aenatum, the ruler of Lagash, the king in Lagash, going into battle against Uma after they cross that boundary line, knock over the stela, and take the territory that was demarcated to belong to the city of Lagash. Okay, you can see that the stele of the vultures is fragmentary. Um, 
some people believe that that might indicate that after this victory monument was erected and set up, it was then destroyed by the people of Uma. Um, so it, we only have certain portions, but as you'll see, we can figure out what's going on. It was found in the city of Girsu, which again was controlled by Lagash. So essentially the, the state of Lagash. It has two sides to it. One is a mythological side, which is depicting the gods. The other side is kind of a historical battle scene, which is depicting Aeonatum uh, going to war uh, with the troops of Lagash against that city of Uma. Uh, and kind of the aftermath of the battle. This is now in the Louvre Museum in uh, France. All right, let's look at the mythological side first. Um, what is going on here is Ningirsu, who's kind of this storm god, who's the patron god of Lagash, um, is standing here with a net filled with captives. Um, and holding a mace, right? So it's, he's essentially the victor of the battle. Uh, he's the one doing the battle. He's casting his net over the battlefield. The symbol of Ningirsu is this lion-headed thunderbird, uh, usually called an Anzu bird. Uh, and it's the symbol of Ningirsu. Uh, behind Ningirsu is probably a goddess. There's debate about whether it's Nanche, his sister, or his wife, or another goddess. Uh, you can see here her crown has that Anzu bird on it. Now this fragment only has a little bit of a depiction of what looks like a chariot, and then another depiction of that goddess. And so the rest of this is kind of their best guess as to what it looked like. So let's look at close up of some of these scenes. Okay, Ningirsu is, you know, the largest uh, figure on this side. Here you can see him holding that net with all those captives. Everything else is filled in with cuneiform text. Uh, and you can see a little bit here. And, you know, some of the text talks about Anatom, Ningirsu's prostrator of the enemy lands. Right? That is, you know, Ningirsu, uh, Anatom is the servant of Ningirsu. He's the one that conquers these enemy territories. We can also see the Anzu bird or the Imdugud bird depicted in other artwork from Lagash. It's always depicted in a ritual context, right? Never as a symbol of the king, but always a symbol of the god, uh, Ningirsu, right? Uh, so here you can see uh, king of La another king of Lagash, uh, this votive relief, which might have been in the temple. Right? And you can see that lion-headed uh, bird figure. Here's another one. This is of a, from a priest right, uh, of Ningirsu. And uh, it was also found in uh, the city of Girsu, part of Lagash. Okay. okay. Behind the god is... The goddess, again, there's debate about which goddess it is. We don't exactly know because it doesn't say on the text. Here's another fragment from that side with lots of cuneiform text on it. And then a piece of that chariot where you can see someone standing in the chariot. Uh, the animal pulling the chariot would have been here. And we have fragment of that Anzu bird here so it's probably Ningirsu riding in that chariot so again Ningirsu riding in the chariot below Ningirsu holding the captives uh, and a goddess behind him okay let's look at the historical side now uh, what we have here and this this is why it's called the stele of the vultures is there's a depiction of vultures uh, feeding on the corpses of the dead soldiers um, corpses of enemy soldiers piled high. Aeonatum leading his soldiers into battle. We'll look more closely at that. His soldiers following behind him as he rides in his war cart, his donkey cart, right? With a long spear here. And then aftermath of the battle, um, the heaping up of the bodies, ritual um, ceremony here with a pouring out of liquid 
and then Aonatum probably seated watching all of this uh, over here. And at the very bottom, there's a, you know, a very long spear hitting someone in the face right there. And it's probably Aonatum hitting an enemy soldier in the face like that. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting because this is one of the first depictions of this kind of warfare. Very early warfare was probably things like ambushes, you know, sort of a melee combat. But look at the way war is depicted now in the early dynastic period. You have something that looks very organized. You have soldiers in ranks, marching in rows, with shields and spears outward. Um, if this was classical Greece, we would call this a phalanx. This was the, the formation of the ancient Greek hoplites of Athens and Sparta. If you've ever seen that movie, The 300, you get a little semblance of that. Right? But, you know, shield protecting your neighbor, uh, marching in close formation. Uh, think about the Viking shield wall. It's similar to that. Uh, and so warfare is not an, a chaotic, unorganized thing at this point in Mesopotamia. It looks like it's very organized on these open plains outside city walls, most likely, with kings leading soldiers into battle. Um, and these uh, troops going out in very organized uh, fashion, like we'll see, you know, like we see later with the Roman imperial forces as well. Uh, so it looks like we've got organized warfare, and this might be some of the earliest evidence for organized warfare. Um, and then we have Anatom here in that war cart with his troops uh, behind him. Okay, and this gives you a little bit closer view, and you can see the royal hairdo. Uh, maybe he's wearing a helmet like they found at the royal tombs of Ur, and you can see them marching over dead soldiers. It says in the text that they fought each other and towards uh, Ananatum, a man shot an arrow. He uh, was penetrated by the arrow, but he broke it off. In the front of them, he made noises, a man of wind. Ananatum and Uma, like a destructive storm of rain, he left behind a deluge. And that deluge is a deluge of destruction. And so the aftermath of the battle, they're heaping the enemy soldiers' bodies, but they're paying... Uh, ritual kind of um, homage to them. They're burying the bodies in heaps. Uh, and Aonatum, because he's depicted as larger than anyone else, is probably also this figure here as well. Right? And there's kind of a pouring out of liquid from the vessel. Down here, you can see that long spear hitting someone right in the face. And then the very graphic depiction of the vultures here. The vultures picking apart the corpses of the defeated enemy. And here you can get, see another pile of uh, bodies. Right? So it's, a, it's a, essentially almost a form of propaganda. We think that it was dedicated in the temple. So we're not sure if everyone in the city got to see this. But it definitely, we would think of it almost as a form of propaganda right that it's showing the connection between the king it's showing the king as a victor the king is larger than life the god is fighting on behalf and commanding the king to fight this battle so the text of the stila again has background like we saw before you know aonatum is beloved by the gods etc etc um the naming of Aonatum, then a little bit about the battle, then as the aftermath, the restoration of the fields, the oath of the king of the new king of Uma uh, to uh, b basically pay rent on the land and not to go to war uh, again and curses on anyone who breaks that oath. Right? So it says in the stila Aonatum, Ruler of Lagash carried a canal from the great river to Guedin. He opened up the field in Ningirsu on its border for 210 spans to the power of Uma. He ordered the royal field not to be seized. At the canal, he inscribed a stila at the boundary line of Ningirsu as a protecting structure. He built the sanctuary of Enlil, the sanctuary of Ninhirsag. Right? So 
he demarcates the boundary once again we don't know if it's the same exact boundary uh, as the earlier one but he demarcates a boundary sets up a stela a boundary stone sets up a sanctuary to the god Enlil right and then the king of Uma swears to Anatum by the life of Enlil king of heaven and earth the fields of Ningirsu I shall exploit as interest-bearing loan I shall operate the levees up to the spring and forever and ever over the boundary territory of Ningirsu I shall not cross to its levees and irrigation ditches I shall not make changes its steelies I shall not smash to bits on the day when I cross over it the great casting net of Enlil king of heaven and earth by which I have sworn upon Uma may it fall from the sky right. um, so he basically says that he will work that land but that they have to actually pay rent on it to Lagash now what happens well at a certain point they stop they don't pay rent because he was unable to pay that barley or Luma ruler of Uma the levy of the boundary territory of Ningirsu and the levy of the boundary territory of Nanshe he removed with water he blocks off the water so that it doesn't flow to Lagash to its steelies he set fire and he tore them out the diocese of the gods which uh, the mount had been constructed he demolished he hired foreign countries as mercenaries and over the levy of the boundary territory of Ningirsu he crossed uh, and this was after Anatum was no longer king his successor was king but the whole thing started all over again right? uh, and this happened several times in this on and off conflict between Lagash and Uma so this Steely of the Vulture, Vultures really gives us kind of a, a visual narrative of this battle um, it's telling a story but it's also making a point an ideological point um, it uses specific themes to kind of get these uh, things across right so it's part narrative but it's also part uh, religious as well right okay so these stelas uh, we'll see them throughout um, the history of Mesopotamia right um, a lot of these you know stelas and, and oaths you know there's usually some sort of you're usually making an oath to the god and there's consequences if you break that oath not just consequences from the other king but curses and, and things like that um, there's also literal curses between Lagash and Uma, right? So here's one that was found from the territory of Lagash against Uma. May your city be destroyed, surrender. May Uma be destroyed, surrender, right? So it's, you know, calling down a curse upon that enemy city. Okay, now we have so many texts from Lagash that talk about this battle. Uh, and this these series of, of different wars um, and it it seems that a similar thing was going on with other cities in Mesopotamia and we seem to see an increase in uh, warfare um, and we're gonna see it kind of comes to a head at the end of the early dynastic period and then something new emerges from this fighting as kings try and battle for more and more territory and become more and more dominant but we also have treaties right so it wasn't all just warfare this um, is a foundation nail it would have been placed in a building right a peace treaty between Lagash and Uma right those were the days when Entemina ruler of Lagash and Lugal Kinishe Dudu great name ruler of Uma concluded a treaty of fraternity right this is one of the oldest diplomatic treaties um, so yes there's fighting but there's also diplomacy as well okay what I think some might raise you know uh, the point whether this was a real need that is if uh, Lagash didn't go to war against Uma would they not have survived 
or was this more of a perceived need? We, you know, they infiltrate our territory. And we need that territory because it keeps us wealthy. Um, I think you could kind of argue that. Certainly, uh, a culture was created, though, where um, not going to war after an infiltration might be perceived as weakness and might make a king look weak. Um, and so you would need to go to war in order to show strength. And so was it biological need or was it cultural need? Right? Once this cultural system is sort of set in place, it's very hard to turn it back. Uh, and that's something we see in a lot of history. Uh, that is, you know, uh, you can prevent war. It's very difficult, obviously. Um, but once countries set down a path of war, you, in many respects, it becomes self-reinforcing and it becomes a little bit harder to reverse and create a system of peace, right? You know, how, um, what did it take for peace to exist today between European countries and between France and Germany? Well, maybe two of the worst world, you know, global conflicts in history. Um, okay, a lot of these Steelers are also propaganda. They they exaggerate, right? The the king is the biggest figure in uh, the piece of art, right? Um, the enemy is called the one who steals fields. The king of Lagash is loved by the gods, right? Um, typically, these expeditions would probably take place after harvest, when um, people were no longer needed in the fields. Um, soldiers, a lot of soldiers would be conscripts, but there were professionals in the army uh, as well, officers, corps, and things like that, and diplomacy, as, as we said. So warfare wasn't the only option. You could come to an agreement between uh, another kingdom. Okay, so we can see how the archaeology and the text uh, support each other in some cases. Sometimes, as we'll see, they conflict with each other, but they provide uh, a lot of evidence about this time period. So we get different types of evidence from archaeology, where we can learn about everyday life and things like that. And we get um, sort of the more royal versions of history from cuneiform documents. So we have you know, histories, literature, religion, laws, commercial activities during the early dynastic. Um, and they become more and more elaborate over time. And a lot of these early texts are continuously copied until later periods. And so we can get later copies that have uh, maybe are a little bit more readable and read about uh, the early dynastic time period. All right, we'll have a little bit of a discussion of Gilgamesh, which you already uh, read for previous week. I hope you enjoyed it, but I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a synopsis and also just a, a little bit of uh, some scholarly interpretation uh, of Gilgamesh.